Shalom. I'm here with Father Stephen DeYoung, who um, contacted me and we had a conversation, which is linked below, which is the most popular thing on my channel and has my I've, I've gained like 30 percent of all the subscribers I've ever had. And like so um, when Father uh, Stephen agreed to come on again, I was like, yes, I'm going to be famous in this low corner of the internet. <laughs> You're an e-micro celebrity. There you go. Yes. yes <laughs> I'm a micro micro celebrity. <laughs> so how have you been, Father Stephen? Good. Good. Before we start, I have to clarify something. Um, in the video, I said something which a lot of people took offense to about Mary. And I have to say, the theologically, my point was, if something horrible had happened to Mary, that would not have changed who she is or who her son is theologically to me. Whereas a lot of people got offended. I even mentioned the possibility that something horrible may have happened to her. And what I pointed out to those people was, um, you know, uh, Catholics call Mary uh, Dolores, the mother of pains, because she she lived a very difficult life. If if nothing else, I mean, uh, the Pieta. So like getting offended at the idea that something horrible may have happened to Mary. Um, I, I think there's there's theological in, incoherence there, but. Uh, I just had to clear that up. I didn't mean to offend anyone. And personally, I don't think that anything I said was anything that in any way denigrated Mary. Right. Yeah. And I I understood the point you were trying to make. Okay. <laughs> Thank right, you. Theologically. But it's the internet, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> like, I know there's a ton of people when I was on Pajot's channel and said that Douglas Murray was too Protestant to be a Christian, who didn't bother to listen to anything I said after that. Okay. They just, he's saying Protestants aren't Christians. And just, you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's... And the other criticism I got was I talk too much. So, this time, I'm going to try not to interrupt you and uh, allow you to speak. Part of the problem there is I listen to so much of you. I think sometimes, like, you would start saying something that I'd basically heard before. So I was like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So you've already heard one half of the conversation and you're wanting to do the other half. Yeah. 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 But I do want to have a conversation. I, I you know, I, I, I'm not interested in being interviewed. I find that really... <laughs> tedious frankly um, <laughs> so what are what are we conversing about father Stephen? well i mean we can we can ramble around on whatever you want um the the immediate thing that sort of came up not long after our last conversation was um some of the hassle you were getting into by trying to explain to people how sacrifices work in the hebrew bible which right, so penal, penal substitutionary about. atonement. <laughs> penal substitutionary atonement is regardless of anything Dominique Vanderclay says. I, I took that from you. <laughs> I, I have I have no idea why Dominique Vanderclay, but he, uh, <laughs> apparently uh, apparently we can call him that. Uh, mm -hmm. But he, regardless of anything the the CRC or any other Protestant says, uh, pro, uh, penal substitutionary atonement. Uh, I think is very clearly heretical to Judaism. And I was actually delighted when I found out that both the Eastern Orthodox and the Catholic don't hold of it, which is, and many Protestants, because frankly, I think a lot of people just assume it is what Protestants believe. I mean, all Christians believe. I thought it was what all Christians believed. And um, it made me feel a lot better to find out that, in fact, a minority of Christians believe in penal substitutionary atonement. 
Now, substitutionary atonement, I know there's all kinds of things about, but like <laughs> at, at the very right. least, the blasphemous idea that of penal substitutionary atonement, it's I mean, it's it, it's just pure blasphemy. I'm sorry. Yeah, the the and w- when we, it, we briefly touched on it last time, uh, when I referred to Domini Van de Clay, um, <laughs> that is, by the way, what that is is that is the, you know, probably a century ago, <laughs> that was the common way to address a Dutch pastor, was Domini in their last name. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't know that. But that's very old school. <laughs> so. <Okay>. Hey, <laughs> um, so last year for Christmas, I actually bought him um, collared shirts, <laughs> and he wore them at at Easter. So yeah. So so yeah, that's a very that's a very tradition. There's a lot of. I mean, th- this isn't necessarily what I want to talk to you about. Maybe sometime I'll talk to him about this. But there's a lot of older there there are liturgical vestments uh back in the day in in dutch reformed churches when they were uh serving the eucharist there was a particular kind of suit that was worn that kind of looks like a suit with tails like there's kind of a thing in the back um i'm sure he does not own one but (laughs) that was he, he didn't even own a collared shirt. He, yeah. He, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, um, but when I mentioned that, when, when I, when, when I heard of that and I said, and I wanted, I wanted kind of wanted to clarify this. And I said, he was just saying what he heard, what they taught him in seminary. That was not a, a dig at him. I was trying to say, he, this isn't something he came up with <laughs> like in his off hours, some weird theory he came up with. Um, I, I, so Paul <laughs> Vander Clay has to be the most, um, the least Protestant of all Protestant ministers I know, because because his he very much is like this is my church, this is the church my father was in and my grandfather was in, and I believe those things which my which I I and it's like, do you realize you're talking about a Masora? You're talking about a tradition. You're talking about like this is like. And I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving my church. And it's like, well, if only Martin Luther had thought similar <laughs> things. Yeah, I was, I was very much in that same place at one point in my life too. Um, but uh, yeah, so that that so when he was the video of his that you responded to, where he was talking about where he was kind of giving this narration of how sacrifices worked in the Old Testament. This idea of the sins being put on the animal and then the animal being killed, right? That that's what they tell you. And I've had any number of Protestants show up at our parish to ask me about atonement stuff. And I say, okay, here's what I'll say. Citation needed. Right? <laughs> Go to the Old Testament, find me a place where that happens. I mean, where it says that's how they were done. That is, you well know there isn't one, right? That that literally never happened. The only time you have sins being put on an animal ritually is the scapegoat of the Day of Atonement, and then you can't sacrifice it because now it's unclean, right? So you, you, know, you send it out, yeah. Um, but, but that is so commonly said that people assume it's there somewhere. And yeah. most Christians yeah. don't spend a lot of time studying Leviticus. So there, I mean, this is this is something that I I do talk a lot. I I, ca- I I call this advanced Judaism, and we don't we don't talk about this substitutionary atonement. And I I don't know if the if the word substitutionary atonement is is in fact even correct because I wouldn't say it is substitu- substitutionary atonement. But um, this is something because of the fear of Christianity that Judaism leaves until later to talk about, which is the, what, what exactly happens with um, Cain and Abel, right? So Cain and Abel, you have 
a righteous man and you have an evil man, right? Yeah. Like Cain's evil. And and when when Cain comes and and when Cain kills Abel, right? The first question you have to ask from a Jewish point of view is, well, why was he able to, able to kill Abel, right? Why like oh, he decided, right? Why doesn't God save Abel? Right? And and okay, God God wants to see that Abel you know, Cain is actually going to do it if if that's your that's your idea. So doesn't justice demand that God kill Cain and resurrect Abel? And the answer is yes. And part of that answer is that, in fact, yes, this is where we see res resurrection in the uh, one of the places we see resurrection in the Bible, which is that God will, in fact, resurrect Abel. But what we see about Cain is God doesn't kill him because God wants to give him an opportunity to repent. And that's God's mercy. And so because of Cain's sin, Abel is, in fact, killed. That is how I understand Isaiah 53, which is the number one question I get from Christians is like, <laughs> what, yeah. what, what's going on in Isaiah 53? And that's, that's how we see the 10 martyrs, which are, are, you know, and that's how we see, in fact, the role of Israel throughout why, why, in fact, ha does it, one of the things Israel as the suffering servant, why doesn't God come and, in fact, stop the people who like the Romans, like the Babylon, like, at the least for the innocent people. I'm not saying all Jews are innocent, but some Jews are. And that's the question of theodicy. That's the question that I think... In fact, early Christians and, you know, I've, I've been trying to fi finish your book, but I've also been trying to finish James, the brother of Jesus. And um, that is the Jewish idea of Yakar Be'ene Hashem Hamavta L'Chasidav. It is precious in the, um, in the eyes of God, the death of death his totally righteous right. ones. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and we uh, we actually we sing that on feast for martyrs. <laughs> right, that verse. <laughs> That's we we actually the the funny thing is it's it's part of the Hallel if I'm remembering correctly. So we also say it on uh, joyous occasions, specifically on spe uh, because Hallel is what you say during joyous uh, occasions. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the weird thing. Yeah. So, yeah, how do I want to go at this first? What when when I get asked about Isaiah fifty three, I uh, I take them to where in the New Testament it says Isaiah fifty three was fulfilled, which according to Saint Matthew's Gospel, he quotes it mm -hmm. and says it was fulfilled uh, when Jesus uh, was healing people and casting out demons. He says, "Thus was really? it fulfilled. He bore our infirmities, and he." And I say to them now, does that mean that when, when Jesus, you know, healed someone with leprosy, he got leprosy? Does that mean, he, <laughs> you know, if he healed someone paralyzed, he became paralyzed? No, clearly it does not, right? So right. why would the verses they're talking about sin be any different, right? <laughs> In terms of forgiveness, I, why does that? I, I, I was not aware of this. I was yeah. not aware of this at all. <laughs> That's, so it's it's literally right there and kind of puts people in a quandary I, are you familiar with i don't i don't this is what so there are a lot of things that i find in like second temple jewish writings and things that were traditions at the time and i don't know some of them i assume and i found out from talking to you in some cases wrongly kind of died out 
-hmm. you know, sometimes I've found out from you that they did continue, but I don't know if this has continued. The, the connections that were made between Isaiah 53 and Isaac. When, when not, Abraham is going to sacrifice him and he is silent and obedient and there, there, there's right. There are texts in the second temple period. There's a tradition of reading it that way. Um, so, and I don't know if that's lasted or if that was sort of a step on the way to something else or. Um, I mean, I, I, I certainly see it, and I it, I would be surprised if there isn't some somewhere some midrash that similarly says a similar thing. Um, obviously, we read the Akeda um, on Rosh Hashanah, and there is this this idea of, um, and one of my favorite hymns is 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 actually about this, um, but the about Isaac and and his sacrifice and and what exactly that means um so there's this rather disturbing tendency among um supposed evangelists to Jews to claim that the rabbis are hiding Isaiah 53 and it's like no that doesn't happen i even saw a website that said um, said the Talmud says that you shouldn't study the Bible, and I'm like, I don't even know what they <laughs> like. <laughs> like usually, I know what the quote is that they're they're trying. I couldn't even find where this idea had come from, right? And so, like Isaiah fifty three, it's it's not it's not one of the better known parts of Isaiah, but like to the, to the degree that people study Nach, the um, uh, Nevi'im and Ketuvim, the uh, prophets and the writings, right? Actually, Isaiah is one of the most popular and the Haftaras. So this is the point some people make, which is uh, they say, Oh, there are haftaras right before it and a haftara right after it, and deliberately it was left out. And I'm like, if you want to hide something in Nach, the last place you would put it is between two haftaras, because the one thing, the so, the only places that the vast majority of Jews actually read, other than the haftaras, is like the chapters around the haftaras, and it's like if there's two haftaras, like. Yeah, reading between them to try to know the context. So it's like <sighs> Isaiah fifty three isn't isn't exactly um, isn't exactly something we refer to a lot, and therefore uh, I, I keep on hearing this thing. And oftentimes when I ask when I speak to Jews about it, and I say Isaiah fifty three, their question is, "What are you talking about?" Uh, we usually refer to it as Hine Avdi, here is my right uh, servant, um, which actually is in 52, I believe it, it, it says Hine Avdi. Uh, but um, the, yeah, so I am not aware of that specific connection, but it's it's not like it's foreign in terms of like as far as talking about Isaac and because really Isaiah 53 I mean when we say it, Isaiah 53 is about Israel we we and we do say it is about Israel we mean that it is about and this is my difference with with Christians um regarding Jesus and Isaiah 53, I have no problem with Jesus being part of Isaiah 53. In fact, for me, when I, so I did a video on Isaiah 53 where I went through it letter by letter. Like I, I, I actually went like through the Hebrew letter by letter. It's like five hours long because people were asking so much. Right. And one thing I had never noticed before is it says Bemotav. It says in his deaths. It's actually in plural in his deaths. 
And for me, that was because a lot of people said, well, what do you think? Is, is that talking about Jesus or not? And for when, when I saw that it was plural deaths, that's when for me it was like, yeah, it, frankly, as far as I'm concerned, it's about all, all the Jews who were cru- crucified. And, uh, Josephus says they, uh, they were crucifying 500 Jews a day and they ran out of wood and, uh, they ran out of places to put the crucifixes if they had wood. So, um, yeah, you're, you're telling me a, a rabbi was crucified by the Romans during, uh, <laughs> during second temple period. And, uh, and that is a, a sort of atonement for the, for the world, a kapara for the world. It's like, that that's not that's that's not foreign to Judaism that's that's actually very integral to Judaism um it's it goes back to and I've been trying to practice this mono yanis is that <laughs> I say it correctly <laughs> well I mean it so <laughs> mono yanis is how modern mono Greeks yanis. Would say it. it's how modern okay. Greeks would say it okay when when mono yanis. Anybody who's not Orthodox goes to seminary and learns Greek. They teach them what's called a Rasmian pronunciation. Yeah, Which, I've been saying monogenes. Yeah, that, that's what that is. That's the Erasmian pronunciation. And it's fine if you're talking to Protestants, they'll know what you're talking about. If you say that to, in front of a Greek person, they might hit you. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm just... I'm, I'm trying my best. Yeah, I, I don't know. No, that's just because they're they're like, yeah. I don't, do, do you? I haven't quite been able to detect it when, when I've heard you speak in Hebrew. Do you use, and I don't know what they call it in Jewish circles. So when I learned Hebrew, there was what was called the classical pronunciation. Okay. And there was the German pronunciation. <laughs> right. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. So I so the German Ashkenazis, right? That is the liturgical language that is used by um, a, a majority of Jews that that was used before modern Hebrew, and modern Hebrew uh, was a man-made amalgam, and they tried to simplify things and in some ways try to get away from Yiddish. And so they took a mishmash of various, um, various, uh, uh, liturgical traditions and made modern Hebrew pronunciation, which is actually what most people use today. And that's what I kind of often use because it's the easiest to understand. Um, liturgically, when I was more observant, um, and people who are observant for liturgical use often don't like using a a weird mishmash somebody came up with. So I tried, I, I, I can, and I sometimes do specifically for the Shema and places, um, and do the traditional Persian, which I I was born in Iran. And so, um, and the biblical one, like the, the classic or the biblical, um, one, that one. So if you learn that one, it actually helps with the spelling (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because all the letters have different sounds. Yeah, that's how. That's exactly why Erasmian was created, was so uh-huh. that every letter would have a different sound. Right, and yeah. and there have been attempts. So there there is an attempt to try to reconstruct Hebrew in in modern times, and there are a few people who try to use that. Um, the people who who really want to be authentic generally will use the Yemenite because 
uh, that was the one that was least affected, and and it's mostly like Arabic, and and so, um, yeah, there there are different, but I generally often use the modern Hebrew, and the modern Hebrew has just started becoming more and more common, partially because people learn modern Hebrew, and yeah, and they're. They're not that different from each other, um, especially be, uh, it's funny to one of the things that I've noticed has happened um, is so when modern Hebrew was created, they decided to drop the difference between the het and the chaf. And like you can barely hear that difference. The het is a, is a, is a little softer than the chaf. Right. And. But just when you're speaking to it, right, there's a difference between aruch, which means um, wide, uh, wide or long, and aruch, which means uh, set or arranged, right? So when, when, when you're trying to say the long table, you know, shulchan aruch, as opposed to the set table, shulchan aruch, right? So modern Hebrew, you, you, you actually, Despite the, it being gotten rid of, in the second and third generations, especially when it matters, when the, when the word like starts, you start hearing people distinguishing it, which, which for me has been interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, back, back to the Minoyanese. Yes. Um, so I don't, I don't know how. I don't know how much old Second Temple stuff you've read. Like, I don't know if, if you're familiar with like Second Maccabees or Fourth Maccabees or. In in the Maccabees last stuff. two years, as I have become very immersed in the Christian world, I have been learning a lot about the Second Temple, and <laughs> I've been uh, I've been learning a lot about Christianity, um, which is, you know very new to me um i i don't i've I've never read the maccabees one okay. two three or four yeah um <laughs> partially yeah. i mean we we don't consider it we consider it a historical work but it's not part right. of our bible right? right yeah 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 um sa same thing with enoch i was it's funny like so with enoch um i i I, when I first started having conversations with Christians, I started bringing Enoch up because they, because of the idea that before Jesus, it was impossible for somebody to be a righteous person, right? It's like, well, what do you do with Enoch, right? And I kept on talking about Enoch, and I didn't really understand that Enoch, like in Judaism, like Enoch's like this. There's one line, in, yeah, yeah, right. That is and something that has gotten pruned out. It, 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 right, but yeah, uh, yeah but yeah. it's it's like one line in the Bible itself, and right. then there are there is Hanukkah, but like, and as far as I know, again, I am no Kabbalist. Like the Kabbalists do apparently talk about Enoch and stuff. I don't know, um, but then I discovered like. Oh, Enoch is is like this big thing, and and there were the the a sense of Enoch and all that stuff, right? But uh, yeah, in in Genesis, I mean, it's there's one line about Enoch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in so First Maccabees is just historical narrative. It's just here's the Maccabean revolt. Here's what happened. Um, second, third, and fourth Maccabees are about are specifically focused not on the wars but on the persecution of the Judean people under the Seleucid Greeks. Mm -hmm. um, and Second Maccabees, a huge portion of the book is a woman and her seven sons and an elderly man named Eliezer who were literally tortured to death. The woman had to watch her children be tortured to death in front of her because they refused to eat pork. That story, I believe, is brought. I know it's brought somewhere in rabbinic texts. I believe it's brought in 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 the Talmud itself. But I that is a story that yeah, Jews still tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and 
um, yeah, the shrine of the Maccabean martyrs at Antioch was a Jewish shrine for centuries, right? Mm -hmm. And then sort of ended up becoming a Christian shrine <laughs> like later on. Um, but uh, and, and in that, it's it's very explicit the kind of thing that you were talking about. That's why I'm bringing it up. That that some of the the sons and the mother before their death pray and ask that their deaths would be received as a sacrifice right for the uh, uh, of atonement for the sins of the people that they would be delivered from right from this persecution right um so here's my question if we set aside for the moment for the sake of discussion we'll set aside jesus of nazareth being the messiah right if someone were to make the argument if the messiah himself did that right the messiah himself decided to lay down his life mm -hmm. for the sake of the people and the world right. right the people first and then and then the whole world that would be sort of the ultimate example of that right there's this pattern that's the ultimate example this is the argument i think the original christians are making including saint paul about christ mm -hmm. not that he does this and no one else did right but that Jesus doing this because he's the Messiah, that makes it the ultimate example. And that fulfillment language is to be filled full, right? It's taking this pattern that's true of these others. But this right. is sort of the exemplar case, sort of the, the ultimate case. So there is this idea that the Messiah is, and maybe I, I, mean, I should put this in Kabbalistic texts, right? Tense. Like, so the sphere of Malchut, right? So that, that, that attribute of God, which is kingship, right, is and which was embodied by David, is that which re receives from everything and has nothing of itself and empty, you know, the, the whole empties himself out, right? Um, and the idea that somebody who is messianic as in somebody who is anointed would of course do that. And, you know, I, I was just reading your book and, and in one of the footnotes, you said the rabbis separated the messianic era from the Messiah. And I'm like, that's, that's a separation in the Bible, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> and, <laughs> And yeah, you know, that the messianic era is inaugurated, right? Yeah. That, well, there, there yeah. is there there are the messianic right. So Cyrus, the Messiah of the Lord, right? Right. And the the question the question becomes: Okay, the we have these people who are anointed, these people who actually are, you know, tzaddik yesod olam, these saints upon whom the 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 world rests right and um a person who is this generation's tzaddik right that that person who is anointed as our leader um one of the ideas some people have is that that is Mashiach ben Yosef in every generation, right? So, yeah, Paul Vanderclay constantly says Jesus came to redefine the idea of the Jewish Messiah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> and my question to him is constantly, um, my question to him is is constantly, who defined it first, and why? What? Who decided to redefine it? Right. Yeah. Um. I I think, what I think he's saying, or this would be the element of that that I see is true. I think in the first century that um, a lot of people there were a lot of at the popular level, mm. right? Your your Judean and Galilean peasants. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were thinking of the Messiah as a John Hyrcanus-like figure. 
and, and Jesus you, is certainly not that. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. And, I think and, that and, might be what he's getting at. How many better and, than Clay is getting at him? Yeah, yeah, and and you see that, and and you see that. I, I think most clearly in the names, like the names of the people surrounding Jesus are all very Maccabean names. Yeah, and, and there Greek was names in some cases from Galilee, there, like Philip and Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's. There's this tension between the only Judaism that, in fact, did survive the the destruction, which is Pharisaic Judaism. And there was this popular, right, Maccabean idea of Judaism. And the rabbis, in fact, I mean, this is part of what made me reading the Gospels be kind of surprised in the types of things that Jesus says. M my shock was that Jesus is Jewish, not that he was born Jewish, or that, but that he was Jewish in that he was Pharisaic. And then I, I hear this a lot from scholars and, and people, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the reason why he was so critical of the Pharisees was because you're always critical of the group you're, you're closest to and things like that, right? And I always imagined Jesus preaching a type of Judaism, which was either Sadducee or, you know, which was outside of the Judaism that actually survived because there were Judaisms, right? Yeah. There were different Judaisms. Yeah, lots of them, yeah. Right? The only Judaism that ha that survived is Pharisaic Judaism, Rabbinic Judaism. And, and Christianity, if you count that. But Well. <laughs> <laughs> Which I know you wouldn't so, necessarily want to. but Well, th this is the problem. The, this is At the least problem. for a while, Christianity was a Judaism. So, so for a couple centuries it was, look, and then maybe not after. Th this may be the most audacious, audacious, and most um, offensive thing that I say, and I'm pretty good at saying <laughs> audacious and offensive things. When people ask me, "Are you a Christian?" I ask them, "Define Christian," <laughs> and when. If they say somebody who follows Jesus, I will usually try to change the subject. <laughs> because as I read the Gospels, the Jesus that I see was Jewish. And if you're asking me, am I following what Jesus taught or is a Pauline Christian following what Jesus taught? My answer is pretty clear. I know who the Christian is. And it's not the two billion people walking around calling themselves Christian. Which, I don't get to redefine words. Right. But if your definition is who follows the teachings of Jesus, and I, I, I have a whole video, um, uh, like, Christian saying... We don't follow Jesus. We follow Paul. And I, I'm not not picking. I am not not picking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Be, th this is this is. No, no. This that, is... And that's. Yeah. No, I can tell you where they are theologically. That's a particular type of Protestant. But but this this is this is a larger thing. Jacob, I plead with you. Stop <laughs> outsourcing your reading of Paul to Luther. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I. So, I saw that video. <laughs> my, my, my 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 friend my friend Jason, who I have a Bible study with, is is in the chat, and uh, next time we're we're gonna try to go through Galatians, because I sat down and read Galatians beginning to end one sitting to try to get an idea. Okay, is am I am I misreading Paul? Now you're reading a translation made by Protestants. I hope that's the difference because I don't understand this difference. man. It is a major difference. It honestly is. Let me give you a huge example. 
okay. possibly the biggest example. Because you've you've commented sometimes that you're waiting for me to get in trouble, right? As a Judaizer <laughs> from other Christians. <laughs> right? Yes. And I've been telling you, it, do, it doesn't really happen that much in the Orthodox Church, right? Um, and most of the criticisms I've gotten from Orthodox people have been, it's been coming from some weird Protestant place. Like, this one will crack you up. A person with a PhD okay. <laughs> said to me that they had a problem right off the bat with Religion of the Apostles because I said that St. Paul was a mystic. And he was a Pharisee, and they weren't into mysticism. They were just into the law and stuff. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I have to. I, I have to pull. I have to. I have to point this out. Yeah. There's a book on. There's a book on on Amazon, which is. Uh, and, and I I I pull it out constantly because it's all about the healing on the Sabbath debate, right? So to this day, we have liturgical readings and practices which are meant to um, remind us you desecrate the Sabbath to save a life. This, this was a fight between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which was intense, which was huge, that we have great documentation for from prior to Jesus, after Jesus. Like, this is... And... I, I mean, I really don't know what you do with this, but because of the Gospels and this idea that it was the Pharisees who were against healing on the Sabbath, you get a... Christians who assume it was the Pharisees who were against healing on the Sabbath. And to me, that's, that reminds me a lot of the, like, Republican, the Democrats were anti-slavery, the Republicans are, were pro-slavery, like, <laughs> loss of any historical memory, right? Yeah. And so I, I don't know what you do with that. Yeah, the, well... On that particular score, I think that's that's part of the fact that Christ's criticism of the Pharisees, Jesus' criticism mm -hmm. of the Pharisees, if you list them all out, you can pull them out of all the Gospels, they all boil down to one thing. He's always accusing them of being hypocrites. I, I've noticed because, that, which yeah. which is like a rabbi accusing another rabbi of being a hypocrite is, is yeah. that's, that's a day that ends in why. Yeah, he's not saying you're wrong, you're <laughs> teaching false things. He tells his disciples, do whatever they tell you to do, just don't do what, what they do because they're hypocrites, right? <laughs> that's, um, so, yeah, so that that's that's his holy criticism. But l let me get let me get to the the Paul thing I was I was uh, I was going to because this is huge. Um so what does works of the law mean when St. Paul says it, right? And it's deliberately translated works of the law. Mm -hmm. The Protestant reading, and only the Protestant really reading, and, and not even, I shouldn't even say the Protestant reading, Luther's reading, right, mm -hmm. is that works of the law is keeping commandments, right? Doing good things, right? Um, that's what it means. Works, doing something, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what works of the law actually refers to is it's the works of Torah, mm -hmm. right? And that's Paul's way of referring to specifically the commandments that were given to the people of Israel, not to the whole world. So... Right. The question the question becomes what what Acts fifteen for me. Yes. Right. Which Right. Yeah. We Yeah, I talked about a little, but yeah. Yeah. And and so if if and I actually read the book Orthodoxy, Judaism and and um Ju Ju Jewish, Jewish and Christian. And Christian. Yeah. yeah. Um 
it didn't get into the meat of it as as much as I wished it it had. It's a very short book. Um, if if Christians seriously believe that um, Jesus that Jesus Paul and Christianity right if a Jew comes and converts to Christianity gets baptized right that that Jew should still circumcise their son and still keep kosher and still keep the Sabbath and do everything that we are supposed to do and that any Gentile it, who gets baptized is similarly supposed to do the seven Noahide laws, which, you know, at least some Eastern Orthodox have in their Bible, the Book of Jubilees. I believe the, the Ethiopians who have everything in, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, then, then my question kind of becomes like, what have we been fighting about for the past 2000 years? I don't, well, I was about to say it's not primarily ideas, but I mean, it, it, it is in the sense that is Jesus of Nazareth the Messiah is, you know, significant as a question. <laughs> right? But, um, but for 2000 well, years, yeah. there I, I am not there, aware of any yeah. church that didn't, when they converted a Jew, say, stop circumcising your children. And I don't know, I haven't, I haven't done an, uh, uh, I'm not a historian, right? So I don't know in the Byzantine period, I don't know what the Orthodox Church did on that once you get past a certain point. I know that St. Paul comes out and says, right, if, if there are people in your church who are keeping the Sabbaths, mm. right, <laughs> and the Jewish festivals, do not judge them for it. And they should not judge you, right, who are Gentiles who are not doing that, right, right. for not doing it, right? Um, but, I mean, that's, Galatians is all about a group of people, and we could figure out why, right? But a group of people who are trying to make Gentile converts from paganism to Christianity get circumcised, keep kosher, do all those things and and Paul saying no. Right? They should not. We would say no right. now. Right, exactly. And and that's why when when we had our well, this was I guess mostly an email. This is why I think the Eucharist has to be the key to understanding that. Because why would any group of Jewish people at that time want to circumcise Gentiles? They didn't want to do that. Right? <laughs> I've I've really been trying to think of this question and yeah. Um, although, although I do want to stick a pin in just one thing. Yeah. If, if Christianity lost that tradition of, of telling Jews that they should circumcise their children, that to me is what tells me, if, if you're going to redefine Paul in Judaism, then apparently the rabbis have been right for the past 2,000 years and all the Christian bishops and certainly the church fathers, Justin Martyrs, we, we can get into what Justin Martyrs, Martyr says about, um, about uh, circumcision. I, my jaw was on the floor. Like, but we can put a pin in that discussion yeah. Yeah, yeah. back to back to what were they thinking i've noticed slavery plays a large part in early christianity and part of what i don't think christians really ever internalized was well i can't say they didn't ever internalize it but judaism's ideas about slavery right and the importance of the distinctions between slave and free 
theologically, right? So in, in the Gospel of John, there's these Jews who say, um, we are descendants of Abraham. We were never slaves. And I read that and I'm like, what? <laughs> like, like, this is, this is like, I, I don't, I don't even understand how you can have a Jewish character in any work of fiction say that sentence. But is, is, is the point, is that the point? Are you understanding that text in the way that most Christian readers now reading it do, gloss right over? Well, I gloss so right it, over it. It's supposed it, to be like, shocking, right? Is it supposed to be shocking that they said that, right? Uh, okay. <laughs> The St. Like, John is Jewish and writing to a Jewish audience. It's right. What is this deliberately? I cannot out? imagine a more heretical statement out yeah. of a Jew, Jew's <laughs> mouth, and obviously heretical in the preface. We are the descendants of of Abraham, because like the covenant between the pieces, right? Right. It's like. Like, we are descendants of Abraham. We were never slaves. That, that, like, the only comparison <laughs> yeah. I can make to that is we are, we are Christians. Our Messiah was never crucified. Like, that's, that's the yeah. only. Yeah. 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 But there are a lot of, there, there, there are a <laughs> lot of, part of what's going on in some of the gospel narratives is, 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 that it's showing that or attempting to show that a lot of the hatred and animus that was directed at Jesus by all quarters reached this level of irrationality. Like there's, there's a, there's a place where uh, in, in St. Matthew's gospel where it says some of the Pharisees went and plotted together with the Herodians and people just gloss over that. I didn't. I'm like, what are you yes, talking exactly. about? <laughs> <laughs> this would be like, like Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton got together to like discuss like how to, yeah. <laughs> but that's trying to show like this, it, that that it became so irrational that people who were bitter enemies, right, were sort of holding their noses and cooperating on this. Now you may say that's not historic, right? I mean. So this is part of part of how I when I interpret the scriptures, right? Mm. All of it. I'm after what the text says. Mm -hmm. I can't force you what you do with it after that, right? You can accept it, you can reject it, you can say, well, this is presenting an exaggerating thing to make a theological point. You can take it however, right? <laughs> But but most right. of the people I talk to like yeah. try to defend it. I call this the crayon, and the only the only good argument I have found for the crayon is um, the early Christians were trying to hide the text from Romans as kind of like you know Samizdat in uh, under the Soviets, and so. They, there were statements which were so exaggeratedly like the opposite of anything that could make any sense that the audience would like be like, okay, like this is, this is somebody talking like in, in South Korea, in North Korea talking about how, uh, how the Kims are so generous and like, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. This stuff never ha obviously this stuff never happened like this and that and like there's code that it's encoded yeah. in in a way. Part part of that is so this is an within American Protestantism. Mm. This is a dynamic um, where when modernism and positivism got a hold of history in 18th and 19th century Germany. Mm -hmm. and wanted to turn it into a science, right? We're going to determine what really happened, right? So mm -hmm. now, Book of Joshua is all propaganda. 
you know, some escaped slaves from Egypt led a Marxist insurrection against their Canaanite, you know, landlords. <laughs> right? You know, whatever we reconstruct what really happened in the background, right. you know, um, because of all of, all of history is the history of class struggle, right? Uh, Demythologize. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I hear that. I, I yeah. read that word a lot. Demythologize. And yeah. the response to that by American Christians was not to attack the modernist presuppositions of that. Mm -hmm. It was to try to use the same methodology to come to opposite results. Right? It was, uh, no, we're going to do the same kind of history. But we're going to say, no, this is like, if you had a time machine and a video camera, <laughs> right? like, this is exact word for word what they said. That... You know, Unf very yeah. unfortunately, this this is something that has started to seep into Judaism and where we have started, like, I, I think we're more resistant, like actual religious people, like you can't read the, the Talmud that way, right? Because the Talmud's very clearly like, um, this happened and some say that happened and they're like two mutually exclusive things, right? Or... The Talmud very clearly, like, it's a, it, there's a discussion. Is the book of Job, uh, an actual, something that actually happened, or is it just an allegory, right? It's like, well, if, if you're going to try to be that type of modern fundamentalist within Judaism, what do you do? Like, oh, yes, the, ra the, the Talmud is heretical now, you know? It's like, it, it, it doesn't work. All, but yet, there has been a strain of it that has seeped into Judaism, and a lot of people who are not very knowledgeable, who, especially people who who are not aware of Talmudics, um, will, because of their supposed religiosity, because they supposedly respect the Torah so much, they they've also started doing that and it's 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 very unfortunate but yeah it it i i i have started seeing it the funny thing is you know what it, who who it is who does this it's children who do this and they have to be eventually taught not to and um maimonides in his introduction to to chapter 10 of of sanhedrin which I, I sent to you, he spends a long time, like, talking about this and and contextualizing it. So I don't, I don't know if it's that modern. It's like Maimonides wrote this almost a thousand years ago. Um, so I can't blame Luther for everything, despite <laughs> all my efforts. <laughs> no, no, that's not. Now, they were Lutherans. <laughs> German uh, <laughs> scholars, but uh, that's not but, directly. But it's Luther. it's just childish. It's just how a child reads a text, and if if you're going to call that, like if you're going to turn the Bible into a text for children, who's who's not taking it seriously? Who is the person who doesn't actually believe in God? If God's text is just something for little children. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's a view. So from the Orthodox perspective, um, the Orthodox Christian perspective, big O, <laughs> um, this is, this is part of what we see as the problem with the, the, the sola scriptura approach, which you can blame Luther for. Um, but um, once it gets subjected to modernism, mm -hmm. right? Once, once those, once those two things come together, because what you end up with is uh, you end up with revelation, God's revelation being a series of propositions, sort of a series of facts, a series of statements. And, for Orthodox Christianity, and most Christians would affirm this in some sense, whether practically the way that their theology works out really follows this or not is another question. But the rev for us, the revelation of God is in 
his son, Jesus Christ, right? That's how we come to know who God is, by coming to know him, not by coming to know things about him from a text. Mm -hmm. right? And there's a fundamental, I, I offered to talk to uh, Dr. Jordan Cooper, and he said he would, so we will see if this happens. But to me, this is one of the great puzzles of the modern Lutheran. Mm -hmm. is um, wanting, I mean, I, I get that they were the original Protestants, so they don't want to give the word up, right? But <laughs> be, wanting to be Protestant, but not actually being Protestant. <laughs> right? In the sense that, the the to me, one of the biggest dividers in Christianity, mm. th this will get some people mad at me too, but I'm sorry, I got to call them like I see them. Um, is Christianity from the beginning was centered around the Eucharist. Okay. Right? That's what it was centered around. And the Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, some Anglicans, <laughs> right? And the Lutherans still are. And the Anglicans who are don't consider themselves Protestants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So the Lutherans are the only ones like that who consider themselves Protestants. And all other Protestant groups are minimally not centered around the Eucharist. Dutch Reformed tradition I grew up in, it was three times a year, whether we needed it or not. We had <laughs> right, the Eucharist. And okay. it could get canceled if somebody was out of town. And mm -hmm. But that's not what it's around, right? So to me, having a Christian church that's not centered around the Eucharist, the sacrifice of the Eucharist, mm -hmm right, is like having a synagogue that's not centered around the Torah, right? Like what, okay, you're well, doing something, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, and no. I, I have to say, okay, so the Eucharist, if it's a Kiddush, if it is Kiddush, and ultimately I think it is, it was certainly at the end, this, this might go back to Paul within Judaism, right? Which is that uh, Paul talks about people bringing and sharing food, right? And if you have, if it, if it actually is, so there's the Torah and then there's, there's the Kiddush, right? There's Tefillah and Avoda, which is in a sense pointed up right in, in and then there is the meal and the kiddush which is another form of avoda of, of service right and it goes along the path of the sacrifice right which is you what is the sacrifice you bring this animal and you kill it, and you burn a part of it up to God, and then you actually eat yes. the sacrifice. Right. Right? Sacrifices are meals. Yeah. Yes. They're yeah. meals. Yes. And Kiddush is a meal. Right? It's a meal you invite people to. Um, and other than the Passover, I'm not aware of any form of Kiddush that is in any way you're, you're not allowed right so right. that's um, why i make the passover the connection right with, with the eucharist in particular because jesus institutes it at the passover so my question right. becomes yeah. like when when jews gather at a passover meal uh, at Passover or Kiddush, just generally week to week, right? It is an actual meal. It is it is something shared. It is something we we sit around, we talk, we sing, we we do all of the things that apparently Jesus and and Paul and the early Christians did. And I know the Orthodox actually give give bread out to take home afterwards, right? which is a little bit better, I would say, but 
it seems like you know when when you talk about um the protestants are like a turkey sandwich and and eastern orthodoxy is like the full meal yeah <laughs> it seems to me if even with if if we go with paul within judaism that not just jesus was jewish paul was jewish um for the past 2000 years we've been having the the thanksgiving meals and the christians have been ha- have been taking their their uh turkey sandwiches to go well so part of this gets into into um orthodox practice right mm. so if you were on the other side of the country you could have come to christmas eve night when we had services for about three hours and then I ended up leaving the church after midnight um, because everybody was feasting because we were breaking the fast <laughs> leading up to that, <laughs> to that liturgy. Um, and there was plenty, there was singing going on. Uh, there was uh, social lubrication with adult beverages going on. There was <laughs> right? sort of the whole swap. I'm glad so, to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that is still a reality. And, where the bread comes from, mm. right? What's called the antideron, the after bread, right? Things sound cooler when you say them in Greek. Um, is that uh, originally, and for most of history, people would bring things with them to the church. So they would break bake bread and bring it to the church. They would bring wine to the to the church. Um, St. John Chrysostom talks about like the orphans would come and bring cups of water because that's all they had, right? But they wanted to contribute, right? Um, And a portion of that would be taken for the celebration of the Eucharist. And then the rest would be distributed and enjoyed by the people. Mm. And so even that bread part is part of that, that that's the bread from which we take the portion that we use for the Eucharist. And the rest is blessed and 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 eaten together for the people who can't stay for the meal afterwards, um, uh, for various reasons. But that that is that is how it was originally instituted. This is this is one of the things with. I, I don't want to feel too much like, you know, I got together with a Jewish person and we spent the whole time picking on Protestants, but. Um, <laughs> But um, Martin Luther deserves it. There's a oh, reason. Martin Luther, I, personally, I will pick on. But um, um, th- there's a reason I named my my thing the Lutherans and their lies. You, yeah, you can't. Of his you, book. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and yeah. It, it, it's like, and and I said I want I want to see all the Lutheran churches burnt down, and I said it because that's what he said, said about, about synagogues. synagogues. Yeah, yeah. So don't you can't have it both ways. Right. Right, the the um, oh, just just a quick note before I forget, before the conversation goes too far afield, that thing with the works of the law. You know who interpreted works of the law as meaning those boundary markers for Judaism? Every church father for the first three centuries. There's a book recently published by Matthew Thomas. It's his dissertation. He surveyed every single work that still exists that references Paul and Pauline theology. Every single one reads it that way and not the Lutheran way as being good. But did they, did they speak about the covenant of Noah? I mean, are there any church fathers that speak about the covenant of Noah? Not, not directly. The I are there are a few that I argue are doing it the way I do it, which is to go through Leviticus. Mm. And the reason I think it's important to go through Leviticus and the Holiness Code, where those four commandments are directed to everyone, mm. is that that means the thing about sexual immorality is not ambiguous. Mm. Right? If we're coming out of Leviticus, then that means Leviticus 18 defines what sexual immorality is. Mm-hmm. Right. And this isn't open to discussion. <laughs> right. This was settled. What sexual immorality is was settled in Acts 15 for Christianity forever. Right. So that's why it's important to me to go through Leviticus there as opposed mm-hmm. to appealing to the Noah 
sense. Of, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, getting, getting back to the, and, and not wanting to pick on Protestants too much. Um, a lot of the image of the early church in, in Protestant circles is, oh, everybody went to somebody's house and they sang some songs and somebody preached and that was church. Right. And the reality is, no, everyone went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And then the Christians and whoever else wanted to come got together and had a meal on Sunday morning. <laughs> right. Okay. At the crack so of I was dawn. actually. And the Eucharist took place within the context of that meal. So I was right. actually wondering about this because so I I remember I was reading in Paul somewhere and it talks about him um like there was a meeting until the morning, right? And so what is really, really common in Jewish uh, communities is because on the Sabbath, you there's so many things you, you cannot do. Um, a lot of people have a nice, what, what's called in Yiddish, a Shabbos shluf, right? You, 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 you catch up on your sleep on the Sabbath, right? And... Um, so after the Sabbath, there's the tradition Malava Malka, which it, it's in every community where there is, um, there is actual Sabbath observance. There's an after Sabbath something and Malava Malka is, is, is what it's called is, is is uh seeing the queen off right um <laughs> and i love you too chad chad um the where um i it made me wonder if it wasn't that the christians were meeting on a saturday night into the morning on a Sunday. And that wasn't how, like, the Sabbath, the Christian Sabbath turned into Sundays. I mean, that is, that, that is entirely possible. It's, it's a little bit difficult with St. Paul himself because he has this pattern when he goes to cities, right? Because he says he always goes... To the Jews first, then to the Greeks, right? <laughs> that order, right? Uh, and so it's hard to tell sometimes in Acts when he's just sort of there participating in a synagogue community and when this is part of the Christian gathering per se. Mm -hmm. But that is possible that that, that extended into a into what what we would now call an all night vigil, <laughs> right? But that, yeah. it happens all the time yeah. in yeshivas. I, yeah. I I you know yeah, Malava yeah, so, Malka goes until dawn a lot. <laughs> that's common in some monasteries just on on Sundays, but on feasts and stuff that you start with vespers at sundown and you go all the way through, right yeah. on Saturday night into into Sunday morning. So that, that is entirely, that is entirely possible. Um, so um, yeah, that Matthew, that Matthew Thomas book, one more nugget I'll throw in. And this is just picking on, on Protestant people. Um, this idea of dividing quote unquote, the law into sort of the ceremonial and the moral mm -hmm. and the uh, civil sections. Right. Uh, Calvin's really the one who does that. Um, but there is a place where it appeared before Calvin. And I'm not saying Calvin got it from there. And this mm. is a cheap shot. But the first place where that appears is in what's called the Letter to Ptolemy, which is a Gnostic text from the, the uh, third century. And the reason it appears there is that the person who wrote it, the Gnostic who wrote it, was trying to find a middle ground between Christianity and Gnosticism. 
on mm. the Torah. So he didn't okay, want to be I'm... a Marcionite and had chuck the whole thing, but he also <laughs> wanted to. Uh, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be nice to P Protestants. I'm gonna be okay. nice to Protestants. I just had an I I just had a thought. Um. So the the Torah talks about three types of commandments, um, and um, these are what we set them into. There are the mitzvot or commandments. And then there's the Chukim, which usually gets translated as statutes. And Mishpatim, which usually gets translated as judgments. Mm -hmm. Now, the mitzvot, um, the commandments, are uh, what we would say are those things which are unique to Jews and we are commanded them uh, because it's it's kind of a holiness code, okay? The chukim are things which we are commanded, but we don't actually understand them. And that's what gets translated as, as, as statutes. And... The mishpatim are those things, judgments, are things which a person, just natural law, right, can can figure out, right? Yeah, yeah. So Using the, and, using the bathroom makes you unclean, yeah. <laughs> well, eh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not sure that that would be considered a mishpat. Uh, mishpatim oh. would, would be something like, uh, yeah, because generally we say the 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 rules of clean and unclean are um, as far as taharot purity. Those um, are. Um, I'm sorry, I have to answer Chad because I love Chad, okay. and, <laughs> uh, and he is a Lutheran, and I love Chad despite the fact he's a Lutheran. Uh, we're not all gonna burn, Chad. We're not gonna burn. <laughs> Trust me. Me maybe, but I no, I don't think the rest of you. Very, very very few people look. We might we might burn for a little while, but God <laughs> did not create this world to burn. No, God did not create this world to burn. Um, and and that's what I dislike the most about Martin Luther, is 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 his <sighs> this idea that God gave. Well. I have to say, he reads it into Paul, that God gave us commandments so that we f should feel guilty. Yeah. Um, is not at all. Yeah. 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 So back to back to the back <laughs> yeah. to the three. I mean, three I can, types I, can I can probably explain that to you, but I don't know that I need to. The I, I've, three I've uses kind of, of the law in Protestantism. Yeah, that, but, but so that's not in Paul. What, when it comes when it comes to Gentiles, a Jew, regardless of what it is, a good like it it makes no difference for the three types. We have to keep it because that's what God said. There, there is, there was has always been, and there continues to be even today, a um, discussion about a Gentile. Obviously, they have to keep those laws, which are this part of the seven, right? And which which is broader than seven, but like if you count them, right, it, it actually probably gets closer to being ninety or hundred, right? But um, the question becomes for a Gentile who is a um, Noahide and is keeping those seven commandments which commandments they may additionally keep and the Mishpatim those things which are understandable are 
generally thought of as things that could that somebody could decide to undertake and the mitzvot those commandments which set israel apart are things which um a, a gentile definitely should not right those are the and, words of the law according to uh, saint paul okay <laughs> um and and works of Torah. as far as chukim i, I there's a lot of debate here, and part of the problem is there's so much there there actually is not enough debate because like this hasn't been a practical thing for us right and and what exactly it means so yeah I, these types of distinctions I don't know if if I can completely lay them. But that's but that's a different type of distinction. Okay. I think the distinction you're making and the fact that you just said it hasn't been a practical thing, I think that's central to what's going on in Paul. Is that with these Gentiles coming now to worship Israel's God, it hmm. became a very practical thing. And these churches in Galatia. Were Gentiles, but there were Gentiles. They were there were Gentiles right. who were going to synagogue. But now they're coming before to the Eucharist. Christianity. Now they're coming to the Eucharist. It had been worked out at the level of the synagogue. Mm. But now they're coming to the Eucharist, and they're coming to receive the Eucharist, which is seen as sacrificial, right alongside a Jewish person mm. who has kept himself clean and pure in all of these other ways that the Gentile is not. Okay, so. Th this right. actually so okay this 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 is actually we something we kind of got on, into last time which was um circumcision and you said that a daughter eats of the passover based on her father's circumcision and i've been thinking about that because the unique thing about the Passover is that, and this is in the Bible itself, you bring the sacrifice in groups, right? Because the, the Passover is not supposed to be left over, right? And the people who bring it, they, they, and this hasn't been practical within Judaism, which, like, I've been going back and trying to learn the laws of the Passover sacrifice suddenly, which, like, I never cared about before. <laughs> but, uh, um, and, and frankly, I, I think I have to do a review of, of, of Maimonides, um, what, what he says there. And, but, there's something about being a member of a household, right? If you're a member of the household, you you can eat. And even a, like a Jew going from one household to the other, and we, we kind of have this with the Afikomen, you're not supposed to go... It is very specifically in groups that the that the passover and that's that's where the exclusivity comes from is because it is a sacrifice that is brought by a household it is brought by a group it's not a communal exactly sacrifice and it's not an individual sacrifice certainly I think that's I think that's part of why Paul is using household language all the time. Talking about being part of the household of God. Because my read on this is really that what he's saying, like in Galatians, right? We're about to this this uh coming Sunday, the first, we celebrate the feast of Christ's circumcision. And mm -hmm. there's some pretty wild icons of it uh that include a moil. Um mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> depicting it happening um, okay. but and we read we read St. Paul talking about this that he says to the Gentiles 
you don't need to go and be circumcised because you've been circumcised with Christ's circumcision. Christ is circumcised. He sanctified himself. He did these things. And so if you are in, you as a Gentile are in Christ, then that's how you come to participate in these things. Mm. Right? Not by becoming Jewish. That's why he talks about establishing your own righteousness, establishing yourself as righteous on your own through keeping those works of Torah. Right. You already have this in Christ. Right. That's how you get access. Right. Mm. And in the context of that, he uses this. You've now become part of the household of God. Right. He is the son of God. He is the heir. So you are an heir with. Jesus. With Christ, with him. Right. Um, that's where your inheritance comes. It comes through him. Right. Not mm. unto, unto yourself. Right. And. My read of Hebrews really is that the pro central problematic in Hebrews that Hebrews is trying to address is the fact that you also want to say that about priesthood, about Christ's priesthood, and Jesus was not a Levite. And my reading of most of the argument of Hebrews is that it's trying to work that out. Right. How if he's not a Levite, how can right <laughs> that do priesthood? And that's where it goes to Psalm 110, the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, all that. It's trying to work it out through that. Right. But but that's really the central idea, I think, of Pauline theology as it re relates to all of this, is that St. Paul sees the Gentile Christ is Jewish, <laughs> right? Christ is right mm -hmm. and Israelite and the Gentiles get a share in that through him not by becoming Jewish themselves so I've I've been trying to think this through especially in reading Eisenman and everything he says and part of me has been wondering if and and Eisenman seems to very clearly think that James the brother of Jesus um did go into the holy of holies and there is this concept of the priestly messiah and the and the right, yeah. and the right yeah and part of the reasons the reason the maccabees the book of maccabees didn't make it into the bible the the rabbis were very critical of this idea that um Kohanim that that priests could also be kings right right, right. this separation and for Dominie Va Vanderclay's thing we've always had separation of church and state in Judaism um it it, it goes back to the bible the um and i i I have been wondering, especially with all of the Maccabean names around Jesus, um, including his, you know, his brother's names and, and even Mary, right? The fact that there are so many Marys, yeah, right? Mary, Obviously, yeah. Mariamne, yeah. right, was, was right at that time, like, there's a reason everybody was naming their their daughters Mary. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, and yeah, I I I have been wondering was Jesus and look, I, I I don't believe the genealogies in the Gospels. Um, I I have to wonder if Jesus or well, John the forerunner, John the Baptist, right, was definitely a Levite. priest yeah yeah and so yeah I, I i i don't know what to think about that but the idea that james would actually go into the holy of holies as a from the tribe of judah that just doesn't seem right to me it seems that yeah, and I I'm not sure where you're getting. I don't know of any ancient sources that talk about that. Have Have you read James, the brother of Jesus? A long time ago. Okay. A long time yeah. ago. Yeah. I, I don't know of any other outside. 
I mean, Josephus talks a lot about James. Um, well, I mean, a fair amount. Not a, I mean, one of his one of his arguments but... is that that in fact the idea of the charges of blasphemy against Jesus are just um, charges that were leveled. So he has this idea that 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 really what ended up happening, especially I guess with the Gospel of John and and Luke and Acts, was that uh, James and Jesus, in trying to erase James, a lot of things from the life of James were transferred onto Jesus, and you know the. The thing with the knees, right, from... Pr yeah, uh, camel with, knees, yeah. Yeah, the camel knees from praying so long, right? And um, his legs getting broken. So he his idea is that, in fact, what happened was James and the lower priesthood broke into the the temple and um, and... James went into the Holy of Holies and pronounced the the holy name, and that's where the blasphemy ideas come from, and that's where that's what the cause of the of his ultimate stoning was. And yeah, I I mean Eisenman, it's funny, he's his ideas have been really disseminating because he, he makes some really convincing yeah. arguments. The problem is he's just such a bad communicator <laughs> and he rambles yeah. so much. Yeah, some of the a lot of times when people talk about erasure like that mm -hmm. um, it's honestly because they're in a western context. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to you know the patriarchate of Jerusalem uh, St. James is a very live figure in piety. And in the, in the second, third and fourth centuries, there's a pile of, of texts ascribed to James and parties, the party of James and followers of, of James. Um, but the erasure you know. of James in acts, I mean, when you look at acts, like, Oh, he suddenly shows up in chapter 15, makes a proclamation, and then disappears? Like... Well, let's talk about the erasure of what? You know, nine of the 12 disciples then, right? Who just disappear, right? Now, well, okay. I mean, Acts so is I a have... book about St. Paul, mostly, right? And, and mean, this, is, this is why... Like I'm, I'm trying to hear your arguments yeah. in in terms of Paul within Judaism. Yeah. But like Paul, the hijacker of Christianity, like it's very convincing. Uh, like I would like to believe the Paul within Judaism, and I would love it. it I would much prefer Christians believe in the idea of Paul within Judaism than what they do believe. But Part of why I want to see Christians, like, actually full force engaging these ideas of Paul within Judaism is I, I, I can't find it convincing for multiple reasons. And one of them is, okay, so if, if Paul really was preaching these things, then why is it that the Jews disappeared, and then then you end up with with the with the church fathers, and I mean, look, uh, they're not a lot better than Martin Luther when it comes when it comes to the Jews. Um, Justin Martyr, In many like, cases. yeah, yeah. It just have you have you ever read Daniel Boyarn's book, uh, Borderlines? I have not. It's about the separation between Judaism and Christianity. And he makes St. Justin the villain of the whole story, right? Like he's responsible for the two, you know. Okay, I yeah. have to tell you, when I read him say that the purpose of circumcision 
God gave circumcision so that when the Jews crucified Jesus, the Christians would then be able to take retribution on Jews because they will be easily identifiable. Right? It's like, this is not a God I want. Yeah. I, I can, no. like, this and, is and this is God? None of, n- none of us, well, <laughs> we have to define us. I mean, <laughs> York, he, he is a saint. The Orthodox Church that stands today uh, does not say that any church father is infallible. Right. Okay. We, there's a distinction between scripture and the church fathers. Okay. Thank you. A lot of American <laughs> Orthodox converts talk. Uh, see, I'll be self-critical now to make up for picking on Protestants. Okay. <laughs> right. A lot of folks in the Orthodox Church in America, not the OCA, like the just, but American people who are members of the Orthodox Church, um, treat the Bible like it's this magic riddle box. Like, no one can possibly understand what's going on in there. Uh, and you just go and you read snippets from the church fathers interpreting this or that. And then say, oh, okay, this is what that verse means. Right? Which is, I mean, hypothetically, I guess a Jewish person could try and do that with the Talmud. I think they'd be laughed at by most people if they tried to do that. Just, like, not ever actually read the Torah and just, like, point to things in the Talmud. But um, <laughs> that's... So that happens, right? That happens, and that's one of the things I argue against, and then people come and call me a liberal or something and say I don't like the church fathers or something. It's like, no, there's the scriptures and there's the church fathers. I've And, and I've had to point out to people, like, you're not going to convince me that St. Maximus the Confessor, talking about the gnomic will, is easier to understand than, like, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Right, <laughs> like one what, what of these two is much easier to understand, right? And it's it's what's in scripture. Um, but so that there are people who talk that way, right? But that's not how the church fathers are supposed to work and have traditionally worked in the Orthodox. Glad to hear. It. Is Glad that to the, hear it. The church fathers, any given church father, and this is why you get. Right, you you go to overseas, right, to an Orthodox country, and Saint Augustine's a saint. Everybody knows that, right? But because he was wrong about a whole bunch of stuff, there are a bunch of American Orthodox people who just can't accept that he's a saint because he was wrong about stuff, right? Like, yes, he was wrong about stuff, and he's he's a saint, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, you can you can. Uh, you can totally be wrong about stuff, right? Be, but, being being self critical, I have to say, a lot of a lot of Jews don't understand that when we say Moses was the chief of all prophets, right, and that the prophecy of other prophets are lower. Yeah, we, we are actually saying that. So I, we actually do mean that there infallibility of the torah to the degree that the torah is infallible and even that i think i I, now i don't want to get all the jews wanting to kill me but like it like the torah is the torah fine like but once you start trying to make the rest of nach the other 19 holy writings um like the torah you're you're already moving out of Pharisaic rabbinic Judaism because you know the fight was most of the other Judaisms were like no we only have the five books of Moses and we were like uh, actually you know we, we we do have a tradition and we have the other books of the Bible. But it's lower prophecy, meaning that you cannot treat it with the same reverence 
And and frankly, we would say Torah Nevi'im Ketuvim, right? right? The writings, you cannot think of it in the same manner as the prophetic writings. And um, that's very shocking to Christians when I say that. that. But it's also shocking to Jews, mostly, again, so a lot of a lot of Judaism has become very Christianized, especially since emanci- emancipation, um, has become... So Reformed Judaism actually named themselves after the Protestant Reformation. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and conservative Judaism, which is not conservative at all. Right, yeah, that's right. the most ironic... <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, they're also from, from reform, right? Yeah. Um, I love you, Paul. Don't worry. My channel's not going to get taken down by, by YouTube. I'm Jewish. You, you, you can talk about burning churches down, not synagogues. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the, um, oh, I just lost my, oh, I wanted to say the, the, the thing with the church fathers is. These are men who are wiser than me, holier than me, and who lived closer to the time of the scriptures than me. And so it's a question of humility in saying, right, that if, especially if they agree about something, right, and I don't get it, then the problem's my problem, not theirs, right? <laughs> that's, right. that's how the church fathers are supposed to work, but it's a, it's a subsidiary thing, right, right to scripture. But so a lot of the Paul hijacking Christianity thing, though, I understand it if your Paul is the Lutheran Protestant reading of Paul, right? I, I get it, right? Because um, this is a dynamic within a lot of Protestant groups. This is where dispensationalism comes from mm-hmm. in, in American Protestant circles. Dispensationalism says, classical dispensationalism at least said, all the stuff Jesus says in the Gospels, he's saying to Jewish people. And he's saying it to them then because in the millennium in the future, <laughs> when they all come to accept him as the Messiah, then they'll have to follow those teachings. Oh, but the church, okay. the Gentile church does not have to follow those teachings of Jesus in the Gospels. But don't that Paul dispensationalists... wrote to the, the Gentile. Paul wrote to the Gentile Christians. That stuff is for the. That's the teaching of classical dispensationalism. I thought, but again, I, I mean, don't all Protestants? And I, frankly, I thought all Christians teach that if a Jew accepts Jesus as their Messiah, which they, we should, that we should then stop circumcising our children. I I have not seen, and I could be corrected on this. But I have not seen anywhere in the Orthodox Church where they would tell you to stop. I don't know of any place where they would command you to continue. Right? Or enforce you keeping kosher on you. (laughs) Right? Mm. But I also don't know of anywhere where they would say, no, you should not do that. No, you must eat a bacon double cheeseburger or we won't accept you into the church. Right? Like, I don't know of any place in the Orthodox world that does that. That require well, this, this, that to like stop. Ma- making Jewish making Jewish converts to uh, Christianity eat pork is actually something that could... I'm sure it has. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, yeah, that goes back, like we were talking about Second Maccabees, right? That was the I know I there were some comments after our last conversation of like, why is he making such a big deal about eating pork? I'm like, people died over that, man. Like that's. <laughs> like, that's serious that's not like a secondary thing right well um, it okay i have to say it is a secondary thing it's it's but when it comes down to it um if and the talmud says if if um if uh if um uh, somebody says to you 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 cannot wear red shoelaces and for some reason, apparently Jews at the time wore red shoelaces. It's not actually a thing, right? Right. Because you're Jewish, um, you're, you're supposed to die even for that, 
Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and because, like, they're just trying to humiliate Judaism. Right. Right. But, but so, yeah, so that's, that's, what it is. but that, that's a live thing in Protestantism. And, and a lot of it comes down to if you just read St. Matthew's Gospel, you would believe that we're saved by works. <laughs> you absolutely would. When the last judgment is described by Jesus in St. Matthew's Gospel, sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell, right? It's, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was in prison and you visited me. Or you didn't. There's nothing in there about what you believe. There's nothing in there about where you went on the weekend. There's nothing in there about any of those. That's what it says, right? And if you take the Lutheran reading of, of St. Paul and you put it up against that, they don't gel. All right. And so the dispensationalists who went that way are trying to figure that out, right? They're trying to figure it out. And built into that Lutheran reading of St. Paul is that Judaism up to the time of Jesus was this legalistic religion where you earned eternal life by keeping the Torah, mm. right? If you kept all the commandments of the Torah perfectly and never sinned, you would earn eternal life. And further, Protestant theology says that's still true. The biggest pushback I ever got from anyone were people going crazy when I made a blog post listing the people who the Christian Bible says kept the Torah perfectly. Mm. Right, like they can't process. Like there, are, there, there's a sacrificial system in there right. to use when you sin. Right, right. So when you sin, you do those things, and if you do those things, you have kept the Torah. Right, <laughs> like, right. So this is this is one of this is one of the biggest questions I get. Genuine questions I get from Christians um, about the Talmud. The Talmud says anybody who says David sinned. It, um, is mistaken. And they're like, are you reading the same Bible I am? Like, how could you say such a thing? He was one of my and, examples of people who kept the whole Torah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like, well, yes, he, he, he repented, right? And, and so, what, anybody who says David sinned is mistaken. Right. And that that's actually in um I think it's in First Kings. Uh when the prophet is sent to Jeroboam son of Nebat when he's being given the northern kingdom. He says, yeah. If you keep all my commandments just as my servant David did, I will make oh. your dynasty <laughs> right? okay. an unending dynasty. And if you read that closely, you kind of go, wait, hold on, flip back a few pages, right? Yeah, yeah. That has to include that, right? And, and the pushback I got from Protestant people was, if that's true, if they kept the Torah, that they didn't need a savior. And I'm, right? But but that's built into that. So right, the, the way it works is keeping the Torah perfectly merits you, earns you salvation. You can't do that as a human. Jesus mm -hmm. comes and does it for you. And the merits he earns by doing it get credited to your account. And all your sins get credited to his account and he gets punished for them. That's Lutheran Theology 101, mm -hmm. right? That's Reformation Theology 101. Um, and it's, I mean, obviously you can't get it out of the Old Testament. That's why he was put down on the Old Testament, but <laughs> like, or the, the Hebrew Bible, right? But, um, you know, and, and so trying to explain to people, that's never what the Torah was. The Torah was not given, like, here, here's what you need to do to inherit eternal life, right? In the okay. resurrection. <laughs> right. So, so the, the verse, Uva Letzion Goel Lashave Pesha Bayako, right? Um, and uh, I know Paul misquotes this. It, uh, <laughs> And a, a redeemer will come to Israel to those who repent of sin in Jacob, right? 
like this is a basic understanding in in Judaism, which is uh, when we repent, the Redeemer will come. Right. As opposed, because it says Uvalitzion Goel Lashavet to to those who repent of sin in Jacob. So like repentance of sin, and frankly, like Jesus and and John preaching repentance of sin in order for the kingdom to come like yeah that's judaism and then what i understood of christianity is that they flip it and it's the the redeemer comes to and and then the in order to save you from your sins and it's like Right. And doesn't Paul misquote that verse? I I, I thought he did. I, I'm no expert in the New Testament. I don't I don't I don't think he did. And I'm going to so I've got one of the projects I just got finished out of several is editing on my fourth book, but my fifth book and honestly, Jacob, I am going to as I'm finalizing this, I'm going to read it past you. It's on Paul. Okay. I'm going through his life. I'm going through all the epistles. I'm doing an interpretive translation. You write faster than I know uh, than I can read. <laughs> <laughs> but as as I finally said, I really want I really want your feedback on it. I honestly I'm being honest. I honestly okay. do. Yeah. Gonna, um uh because because I want to know where the holes and stuff are, where the stuff is you don't buy you, right <laughs> so yosef once he finishes his dissertation he's getting a dissertation in in robotics okay. yosef might even be a better person but he's supposed to instead of listening to the well it's shabbos where he is right uh, he, uh, right now anyway but um he 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 might actually be a better person than me because he knows second temple judaism better than i do but um i would i would love to because honestly as i Part of what slows me down while I'm reading, I'm like highlighting. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Part of it with Religion of the Apostles, too, is an audience thing. Because I've heard some of your comments about it where you're sort of like, well, why is he putting these two things together? And if you were a Protestant so reading it, you'd know why I put those two things together. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. that's where yeah. – so, I, you know, when we had our last discussion, we, we talked about – Paul saying um, the Torah was given by angels. Yeah. And you're like, no, he, he was talking about Jubilees. And then right, that, that's a I was point. reading a religion of the apostles and you spend some time and I'm like, he's trying to establish the importance of angels. He's not trying to denigrate the Torah. And that's, and I can understand like that. That was one of the things that I actually hit last night that I was like, yeah, now now I understand he's he's trying to explain the idea of angels and saints to uh and yeah, so. Yeah. Um but so yeah, with with you can get that kind like Luther's that kind of structure out of a certain reading, that reading of of St. Paul, but you you can't get it out of much of anything else. Right. And so that's why he's James, first, second Peter, eh, not so much. Right. <laughs> Old Testament, you know, not, not so much. Um, because it's 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 harder to uh to get out of that. And I I think the older, honestly, the older reading of of Paul fits in with Right, the the other books that ancient Christians grouped them in with, right? They didn't think there was this radical contrast, right? They 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 thought, right? The people who originally put it together thought this works together somehow, right? Um, but that 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 is so embedded now in a lot of Protestants, even very well educated Protestant friends. A certain biblical scholar to whom I'm often compared, who I won't name out of respect, in an interview was asked, is there anything heretical in the book of Enoch? And he said, yes, it says we're going to be judged according to our works. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, forget the Hebrew Bible, right? 
Have you read St. Matthew's Gospel? Have you read the book of Revelation? Have you read the book of, right? Have you read, like... Well, this this was my this this has been my answer about penal substitutionary atonement. Like yeah. somebody asked me, where does the Bible talk against penal substitutionary atonement? And I was like, pick a book, any book. Right. Well, and, why I, I, and I literally book? meant it. Pick a book, any book. Show it to be there. Right? Why do we have to find a place that talks against it? Right? There's well, nothing there that talks okay. against transhumanism. But <laughs> does it mean? Well. Okay, for me, for me, like, for me to say that it is something forbidden to Gentiles, yeah, right, and it pains me to think that some of the people I I, I care about, friends I have, believe in penal substitutionary atonement because, despite the fact, like, it's not exactly one of the seven um, Noahide laws. It is so blasphemous. You know, when Ezekiel spends that, you know, like a whole chapter railing against and then like cons like the Bible rails against this idea of God like punishing this the the innocent and like that's you the are mark saying, of the unjust judge in Isaiah, yeah, yeah, and 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 <laughs> and that's what you're saying God is, and so like, you know, when a Christian says to me, "Oh, well, after I die on the day of judgment, my answer to God is going to be, oh, my sins, an innocent person." <laughs> He, he he was tortured he, to death for them. Yeah. Yes, and and that's and 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 my thing is like, um, I I I honestly like it, it's just so blasphemous that I it goes beyond just like I don't want to, you know. I, I go to great lengths to say mon the monarchical trinity is is something that is not prohibited to Christians. Yeah, totally beyond the pale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I can't even start to say that about penal substitutionary atonement because it's just it's just complete blasphemy. Right. But to to me, because it's pretty much our Protestant friends who believe it, right? Sola Scriptura, right? Mm. Show it to me. Yeah. It's not there. There's no place where sins are put on the animal before it's sacrificed. Uh, the, I brought up the Passover last time. I know nobody, Vanderclay said, oh, I see it there. We can run through this real quick, okay? So when the Passover came around, Tenth plague, death of the firstborn. If you only had daughters, did you not have to do it? Because uh, <laughs> right, because this lamb is dying instead of your son, right? In in, in our substitution. Oh, so that, here. oh so, the idea was so the idea is that the the past the kid died because of. Oh, instead of? Yes. Oh. That's why they're trying to see substitutionary atonement in the Passover, is that the lamb is dying instead of your 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 son. I'm like, well, so, so if you just have daughters, do you not have to do it? Like, if you... Yeah, and, and why are you tying it to your own bed? Why don't you tie it to, to, to your son's bed? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and put it, it over his door. Yeah. <laughs> and... What if you're the only son of an only son of an only son? Do you have to do three lambs? Yeah. Right? And like, and why in the text does it say if your family is very small, then you can get together with another small family and share a lamb? Is right. the lamb working for two kids then? Right. Is that just the one? And then backing it up even further, and most importantly, why did God want to murder more Hebrew children? Right. Yeah. That's the core of it. Yeah. This, Where he would accept the idea, instead. Th this idea that there's <laughs> only 
that the only way, and I, I get this from Christians all the time, they're like, you can't do the sacrifices, so how do, how does God forgive you? And it's like, he could forgives me. <laughs> like, what, what, why, why is the fact I can't bring a sacrifice? But, like, it, it always, so this is one of the things that impressed me, like, with the Judaism of Jesus, was... Um, he drives out the, when he's driving out the, um, people selling sacrifices, like the animals and stuff, right? So he, he releases the, the large animals and, but he doesn't release the birds. And so the, the sin offerings, right? There, there were if if you could afford it, you brought animals, and if you couldn't afford yeah. it, you brought birds, and if you couldn't afford it, you brought bring meal, right? You you bring what you can uh, afford, and then, and then you kill that meal, and the meal suffers <laughs> and <laughs> bleeds <laughs> and bleeds, yes. right? And it's like yes. no, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. And for me, it was it was actually it was like. Oh, this is a Jewish story. He doesn't he doesn't release the birds because you know who who that would hurt? The poor people. Yeah. Okay, we have a hard stop at 4:30. At 4:30 this uh yeah. we, we are going to stop. You turned into uh, Yes. <laughs> um and so um the next 20 eight minutes are uh we we can talk about whatever you want but uh, this broadcast ends at 4 30. yeah yeah <laughs> okay. yeah yeah so but yeah so that's and that's another thing I point you like there's sin offerings where you don't kill anything yeah and when you read the the if you read Leviticus one of the interesting things is that the killing and even the exsanguination of animals mm -hmm. is not described in any detail in the right. text. Right. right. Obviously, there were practices, but in the text, it does not say kill it in this way, cut its throat with this in this way, collect the blood in this particular type of bowl in this particular way. That's not ritualized. There's all this detail about which parts go to God, which parts go to the priests, which parts go to the, the people making the offering. Right. That's all highly ritualized. The meal part. Right. The, <laughs> right. This is... This is one of the things, um, as far as the slaughter, this is one of the things that rabbinic Judaism has always, and it's in the Talmud itself, brought against those who don't believe in the tradition, the sola scriptura types within Judaism. <laughs> is um, It says, when you slaughter an animal, you shall do it according to the laws that I gave you. And it's like, okay, where are these laws? Right? Right. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and and what's interesting when you compare, because um, I've done all this study of ritual, when you compare like Leviticus to other ancient Near Eastern ritual texts, we get far more detail from the Hebrew Bible than from any of the neighbors. There's far, far more just taken for granted, mm. right? That people know what you're talking about and that kind of thing. But you also, you also, some of the reasons why for things, right? Like you start to notice this is that in Leviticus, God is getting all the best parts. Mm. Whereas like the Greeks referred to the sacrifices sarcastically as the burning of the bones because they'd sort of take all the parts they didn't want and offer oh. them to the gods. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or they could use for something else. <laughs> um, but it's, and, and so to me, that's why I do a lot of this comparative stuff with these other ancient Near Eastern cultures and stuff is in that comparison, right? A lot of this stuff comes out, right? Like the, the show bread in the tabernacle, everybody else's temple, they're bringing food to feed to the, to the gods. Mm -hmm. And in the tabernacle, God feeds his priests. Right. While they're serving there from his table, you know? Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, the, and, and that's, you know, I, I'm not one of these people who goes and says penal, the penal substitution thing is is pagan because, frankly, you don't see it in paganism either. <laughs> oh. like, sacrifices are pretty clearly meals. Like, broadly, they're, the, they're in the category of hospitality. 
right? Because you have offerings of incense and that kind of thing that aren't strictly speaking food. But the most common form of hospitality is a meal, right? That you share, mm. right? right. Um, and that's how everybody sees it, right? And so there are these changes made that God makes to the Israelite practice to make certain points and to set it apart from these others, but it's still within that overarching canopy. And nobody's nobody's causing the animals to suffer. Right. <laughs> right? That's so that's they die. it's funny. Sherry just mentioned this, and so uh a really strange thing happened about twenty some years ago, which is this Gentile autistic woman um decided she didn't like kosher slaughter practices, bought herself a um one the tractate on 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 um slaughter uh from the Talmud, read it and designed a new way to um to slaughter cows. Which if you had asked me, like okay, the the idea you're going to change how animals are slaughtered in the United States um and you're an autistic gentile woman right, going to the ra orthodox rabbis and doing this yeah like i was like that's not gonna that that's not gonna work it takes chutzpah. um it oh, takes dear. it takes a lot of chutzpah <laughs> and so we now slaughter animals completely differently than we did before because her argument uh, was based in Judaism, which was, oh, if you do it this way, it will be kinder to the animals. And honestly, it's like we like innovation to kosher slaughter is not something the Jewish community is very like <laughs> it's it's not like, yes, we have we have a a very strong dislike of changing how we do things, especially like kosher slaughter. It's like, I often have my problems with how it's done because that's the traditional way. And it's, but like people are trying to be really strict or whatever. And, and everybody's trying to be stricter than thou, but look, um, there's a reason why being kind to animals is one of the seven Noahide laws. There's a reason why early Christians and some Jews um, were vegetarians, right? This idea of being cruel to animals is absolutely, like, not a Jewish thing. And the idea of that the sacrifices were somehow inflicting pain and torture on the sacrificed animal is just wrong. Yeah. And there, there is, there is stuff like that in the pagan world, but even that is not for the purpose of purpose of making the animal suffer. It's just this kind of weird demon, demonic stuff like the Dionysian mysteries where they eat animals alive and stuff. I mean, it's just you know, deliberately transgressive, like, kind of stuff, you know. Uh, but that wasn't even regular pagan practice to make the animals suffer. But that's in the, in the Orthodox Church. And this is something somebody said I should have brought up more in our last discussion when you're talking about Christianity being Judaism easy mode is the Orthodox Church, if you add it all up six months out of the year, if we follow our fast, we're vegan. Mm. <laughs> so um, we still keep a Wednesday and Friday fast two days a week most of the year. And then we have Lent, which for us is close to 50 days before Pascha. And then, uh, which we still call Pascha. Um, so is that why Jordan Peterson won't convert to uh, like uh, <laughs> being Orthodox? 
<laughs> you couldn't eat for the be all <laughs> for carbs. six months. Yeah, <laughs> we all end up carbo loading for this first six months. Well, that's that's we were fasting for forty days leading up to uh, to Christmas. That's why we had the big celebration at the. Mm. But then, see, there's also then periods of feasting, right? Um, mm. But that's that's part of the discipline, and that's that vegetarian is the reason for it. And that's, I mean, I see that playing out in the early chapters of Genesis, right? In paradise, they're eating fruit, which is, you know, the creation is sort of offering itself to humanity. The outside of paradise, they've got to work and bring it out of the ground, right? And then, and then even after the flood, when permission is given to eat meat, that's where the blood prohibition is put in. Right. Kind of keep man from becoming totally predatory and yeah. So yeah, that's a, that's a lot, but yeah, the, 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 you don't have suffering animals. You don't have, there's no principle and you could correct me, right? <laughs> in Jewish tradition. I don't think you'll have to, but, and this is another comparative thing, right? You look at like Hammurabi's code, mm. torture, beatings, floggings, right? <laughs> it's punishments for crimes. You look at the Torah, you mostly see restitution. You know, okay. Are, are there so, beatings anywhere in the Torah? Yeah. <laughs> so Paul talks Paul talks about three times being beaten the right. 40 minus well, one. Even, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a I know it's a tradition, but it, it, it is, and um the understanding uh, at the time and I our understanding is that any prohibition in the Torah that doesn't have a um, that doesn't have a specific uh, punishment, the punishment is the forty minus one, okay. and that was that was operative during um, Jesus and and Paul's yeah. time, and I am not aware that Jesus said anything against it. Um, and that it that that's just the understanding is that was the that beatings... over and above, or was like for example no. someone steals right and they've got to pay back. They've got to make so, restitution. No, no, no. Would that be an no. addition so, to that? Or... Any no anything. Okay. So it was it was it is what was considered the default if there was no other. So. When the Rather Bible be says cut off from among the people, or so karet, right. right? So karet being cut off—that's that's in fact considered the highest level, right? Right. Below that are the four death penalty ones, mm -hmm. and then there's default is the beatings, okay. and then restitution, and it those are anything that's less than. Um, and rabbinic courts would would just beat people um, a, as punishment. So that so that's something. Um, <laughs> my uncle got really mad when I when I mentioned this because he he really hates um, a lot about Islam, and so because of the lashings, like he he so much. We come from Iran, like. And yeah. the corporal punishment thing was, but yeah, so, so the beating, like the lashing, uh, the, the 40 minus one and 40 minus one. I mean, this is, this is something like 39 at this, is, there are 13, 39 classes of, this is something mystically like, so baptism, right? Baptism, ritual baths have to have 40, um, have to have 40 cell of water in them. Right. Right. Because, and there is this idea that, you know, there is a sort of atonement in, in being beaten. And in fact, that's why karate, which is a spiritual exition is considered worse than the death penalty because right. the Jewish idea is, well, why do we have a death penalty if uh, it's like, oh, this is this is a sort of of penance, and that's that's why my uh, Maimonides says um, that for severe sins, it's it's you repent and and your death 
is what actually um, affects the your your final uh, penance. Yeah, Paul Paul says that actually at one point uh, when he's talking about excommunication. Mm -hmm. Somebody talks about turning the road to Satan for the destruction of their body and the salvation of their soul. Okay. That same kind of idea, right? <laughs> right that yeah. their death would be, and that there are in in Orthodox canons. We don't really have canon law the way the Roman Catholic Church has canon law, but uh, mm. uh, there are certain sins where you are denied the Eucharist until your deathbed, mm. where you've sort of put yourself outside. Until that moment. And then at that moment of your death, there is mercy with that same kind of idea. Right. Okay, that, so I have yeah. to say, so when you're trying to say Paul within Judaism, right, as opposed to Paul stealing Judaism, right, this is this is one of the uh, stealing Christianity. I mean, uh, the, this is the this is one of the things that got me is in the Jewish community. Um, if you are repentant, yeah, that's beautiful and that's great. But um, if you were a sinner and you you repent, you go to the back of the line. You don't go to the front of the line, right? And so this idea that Paul goes from persecuting the church to being the leader of the church is like, Mm, that's not that's not how we view repentance right that your repentance is between you and god and we certainly say that if you are you are repentant it's possible that you're a much better person than the than the people we see being good people we don't know right the the worst of murderers might in fact um do Teshuvah, be be repentant of what they do, and we say that if somebody out of love does um, uh, repent, that person's sins are accounted like mitzvot, like good deeds, because through his love of God, he has in fact redeemed them, right? Mm -hmm. But that's between you and God. I don't know what's in your heart. I can't decide that you repented out of love of God. And so that's part of what really rubs me the wrong way about the Paul story. Is right. To me, that's part of the importance of the point I try to make. Um, and that I think Paul himself tries to make. Like when he starts borrowing all this Jeremiah language about his experience on the road to Damascus. I don't think he saw himself as a leader in the institutional institutional church. That's a little bit of an anachronism, but right. <laughs> like a, a leader in, in the sense that those whom he calls pillars, right? Say James, St. Peter, St. John. Am right? I not an same, apostle? In the same, he does say he's an apostle, but not in the same way. I think he sees himself as a prophet. He was sent on this particular prophetic mission to go to the nations, to the Gentiles, and bring the 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 news of the Messiah to them. That's what he thinks his job is. And within that prophetic context, right, the role of the prophet post Moses, right, the prophet, right, in in for Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, is always a little bit outside of the king, the priest. There was a court prophet at various points, right? Sort of, mm -hmm. but even then, right? Nathan was kind of a court prophet for David, but he he was there to confront David when he needed to, right? Um, and Elijah certainly right, was outside the right the power structure, and I right. think that's more how Paul sees himself in his writings he sees them as the authority structure and mm -hmm. him on the outside with this particular task and occasionally there's misunderstanding or conflict you know based on that right 
Um, but I don't think he sees himself as like, oh yeah, St. James, you're not in charge anymore. I'm the boss now. Or St. Peter, you're not in charge anymore. I'm the boss now. You have a very different view of Paul than <laughs> anything I have ever heard out of Christian. Well, that's, I, I, I'm, I, it's because I believe it's the right one. <laughs> right? And this Paul project I'm doing is to try to lay that out. And, you know, I, I think it's true to what's really going on. There. And there's a lot of layers of different things, you know, that have been Western theology, the, you know, and, and the Protestant Reformation, all these things that have been layered on top of him. And mm -hmm. I think the person who he was in his life when he lived is very different than that dynamic, right? I, I think if Paul is the person he's presented as and taught the things that the Lutheran reading of Paul presents, then yes, he did hijack Christianity and turn it into something different. Because that that is at odds with the rest of the New Testament, if that's an accurate reading. But I just don't well, think it is, right? So I don't blame people for seeing that conflict there right and either trying to reconcile it like uh the dispensationalists do or uh just saying no it's all conflict like Eisenman <laughs> does right but that conflict is based on a particular reading of Paul that I just don't think is correct and I don't think is that old hmm what 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 gets me is is the practice um in practice christian christianity has um uh, very much been dismissive and i mean you can you can call it marcionism and yes like marcion was a heretic he was, yes. he was declared a heretic yes. i realized that. everyone every church father wrote something against marcion it was the thing to do <laughs> um <laughs> At the same time, it's like, it seems to me that, and like, what do you do with the divorce between, um, between Passover and, you know, the, the Jewish calendar and the, and, and the Christian calendar? So I tell you specifically Nicaea, the dating. Yeah. Because, I mean, we still call it Pascha and make a point of it. It always cracks me up. I mean, you get these people, oh, Easter comes from a pagan holiday. I'm like, do you consider the Jewish Passover pagan? Like, what? Uh, but <laughs> well, right. But but it was a deliberate divorce. It was right. a deliberate yes. divorce yes. from the Jewish yeah. um, calendar. And this is, and, and one of the things I was trying to get light, get at, even with that chart, which you rightly pointed out is not entirely communicating <laughs> what it should communicate. I was, tr the point I was trying to get at really was that when do we have Judaism and Christianity as two separate religions? And I think that the terminus ad quem, like the latest possible point for that is about 500. Certainly by 500, they're two separate religions. Right. Um, the further you get before that, the less clear it is that they're they're separate. And in the fourth century, a lot of that separation is happening. Um, and that was now part of what's been lost to history. So I did, uh, I wrote an article. I think I mentioned this to you, but I don't think it was on the stream. I did an article which was uh, accepted for publication in a Protestant theological journal and has never been published. So they may have accepted it just to <laughs> circular file it. Um, but on uh, uh, St. John Chrysostom's Sermons Against the Judaizers, mm -hmm. sometimes titled Sermons Against the Jews, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the Judaizers is more accurate because they were preached when he was in Antioch. Mm -hmm. And Antioch, I don't know how much of the history you know about Greek and Roman Antioch, but it was a third Jewish. A mm. third of the population of the city was Jewish from its founding. Mm. Um, they took the Keruvim from the temple 
in 70 to Antioch and put them on public display in the Jewish quarter because they were the Romans were worried that there was such a huge Jewish population there, it might be the next, right? Okay. If the revolt spread. So they put it there as this emblem, hey, <laughs> right? This display of their Roman power. So there was this huge, and, and by, by the fourth century, when St. John lived, centuries established Jewish community there. And what was happening was, on all of the feast days, his people were all going to the synagogues and celebrating the Jewish feasts and not celebrating the comparable Christian feasts. Mm. And so those sermons are not preached to the Roman authorities trying to get them to go after the Jewish community, or even preached against the Jewish community. They're preached to his own people to tell, stop going over there, <laughs> right? You need to be here, <laughs> right? Not over there, right? Um, but so that shows you, in, uh, as major as Roman city as Antioch, at the end of the fourth century, there was still that permeable, right, sort of border. Apparently, the Jewish community was perfectly fine with having a bunch of Christians show up. Right at these at these festivals at that time, right? They weren't complaining, as far as we know. Right? Um, so, so I think a lot of those deliberate things and mm. our the Orthodox dating mm. of Pascha is not very far from the Jewish dating of Passover. It ends up being close. But, it's not always but it the was direct a deliberate, coming. but it was a but it deliberate. was deliberate to have it be on a different day, yeah. and it was part of trying to enforce that separation at that point mm. of saying we need the Christians to celebrate it with the Christians now, mm -hmm. and not go to the synagogue and not, and so at that point in the fourth century, that's where we're at in the mm -hmm. in the separation. We so that's that's how I take that. I don't have think to it was wrap it up for today. Oh yeah, we've got to go. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh. I will let you have the final word, and I will end the broadcast. This has, as always, been enjoyable. Um. And your my channel is very much your channel because apparently all everybody who watches my channel came here to see you. So. <laughs> I don't know everybody. That's. You do okay mm. on your other streams. Not, not even comparable. 1.7 thousand watch hours on our previous thing. That, yeah, but, like, my more than my Genesis 1 video, which, like, I am shocked anybody <laughs> ever watched it. Like, that's the one thing on my channel anybody ever watches. And I just checked right before this that they have the same number of watch hours. Oh. <laughs> well... But now I've just alienated all your Protestant uh, viewers. So <laughs> they all leave. Um, no, I, I, like I said last time, my 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 thought last time was if everything went well, it might be the beginning of a friendship, right? I hope this is the continuation of one. Um, You're I, a friend of mine if you would like to be. <laughs> I would like to be. <laughs> um, and uh, I wish I could offer you hospitality down here in Louisiana if you ever came down, but most of it's shellfish, so <laughs> it would be limited I... in the amount of <laughs> hospitality I could offer. Uh, but uh but yeah, oh I th I think this is I, I, I think this is good. And I like talking to you again because we could be clear about our differences and our disagreements and also enjoy finding things where our understanding is similar. And I, I still have a lot to learn about later Judaism, right? <laughs> Past what I've studied, and I enjoy learning some of that from you. We'll leave it there. <laughs>